everyone, and welcome to Night School. I'm Lynn from the Nightlife Programming Team. And I'm Christina, the event producer. And so thanks so much for tuning in for yet another Night School. Um, we're excited for tonight's super unique Night School program in which you'll not only learn about our upcoming exhibit, Venom, which will open shortly after we do at a still a TBD date, um, and you'll get a sneak peek into the science behind it and some of the animals in it, but you'll also learn about all the creative, fascinating work that you might not notice right away when you visit an exhibit, like how to design an environment for both live animals and light sensitive scientific specimens, and what goes into an exhibit word mark and that wall color choice. We're starting off the night diving directly into the venomous animals and animal care. Kicking off, we have Dr. Lauren Esposito back, the Academy's curator of arachnology, giving us an overview of arachnids and their use of venom. Next, biologist Emma Cosina walks us through how to care for these often feared animals in the exhibit. Then, as Christina mentioned, we're, we'll journey to the design side and the creation of the exhibit itself. We'll go behind the scenes with exhibit designer Ashley Boitcher and learn more about what it about what it literally looks like behind the scenes of the exhibit wall. And we'll close out the night with visual designer James Davidson previewing the graphics and visuals that went into the making of Venom. And as a reminder, as always, tonight's program is live. So please say hello in the chat. Um, we'll do a couple of Q&A sessions mm -hmm. later on. So drop questions into the chat or the comments. Um, and we'll see you a little bit later. But first up, um, after our little transition screen, will be Dr. Lauren Esposito. Hi, everyone. I am Dr. Lauren Esposito, and I'm the curator of arachnology at the California Academy of Sciences. Uh, and I'm here to talk to you about my favorite topic, which is venom and venomous creatures, um, most importantly in the form of scorpions. Um, so as an arachnologist, I study scorpions and other venomous creatures um, that you are probably familiar with, like spiders and other kinds of arachnids. Uh, but first, I just, I feel like I, I whenever I come in and talk to folks out on the public floor at the Cal Academy, I'm always talking about arachnids and I always have this idea in my mind that I shouldn't be biased towards just scorpions because like I should be inclusive of all the arachnids. Uh, and so today I'm finally for the, I think the very first time ever uh, talking about just scorpions at a nightlife. Um, so I'm super excited to introduce you to the field of scorpiology. Um, so what is scorpiology? Uh, well, first it's the study of scorpions, uh, scorpions specifically. Uh, but a scorpiologist, which is what I am, is a scientist who studies scorpions. So, hi, I'm Lauren, the arachnologist, aka scorpiologist, uh, and I am here to introduce you to the world of scorpions. Um, so first, scorpions are arachnids. You probably are most familiar with arachnids like spiders. Um, maybe you're familiar with ticks or mites, which are also arachnids. Uh, and then there's a whole bunch of other kinds of arachnids um, that are things that you're probably less familiar with. And I imagine that most of you out there have heard of scorpions before, but you may not have realized that scorpions are indeed arachnids. So uh, let me explain, walk you through how you can figure out if something is or is not an arachnid. Um, and first, just in case you've never seen a scorpion, they come in a variety of shapes and forms. Uh, this one here you can see has really narrow, thin claws. And I'll talk a little bit in a moment about the importance of that. Um, but first I'm going to show you this guy, which has these big, thick, really robust claws up in front here. Um, because scorpions are arachnids, like all other arachnids, they have eight legs or four pairs of legs. Uh, those are on each side, they're bilaterally symmetrical. Um, and in addition to their eight legs, they have a sting down in the back, that's sort of the business end. Uh, and they've got two claws up in front, that, that's the party end, I guess, uh, which I'll tell you a little bit more about in a minute. Um, they have three sets of eyes, and those eyes are arrayed in sort of a triangular shape. Uh, and each set of eyes ranges from two to upwards of six, um, although in general there's always, almost always at least eight total eyes. They also have kind of two main parts to their body. Um, they've got the head up at front, which is where the claws are, and then they've got uh, the, the rest of the body uh, down towards the back, which is what sort of post legs and including the tail. Uh, and that's similar to all other kinds of arachnids. So all arachnids have two major body parts. Um, and and uh, 
you'll probably see that mostly in spiders where you see they have these really two distinct kind of kind of globs, one in the back and one in the front. In other arachnids, it can be sort of fused like it is to some extent in scorpions where there's no narrowing between the head and the rest of the body. Um, but that's really sets it apart from insects, which typically have three major body parts. Um, so if you've ever looked at an ant or a bee up close, they, they typically always have three major body parts. Uh, so just, just to point out a couple of things. First, uh, scorpions are really, really old lineage. They're about 430 million years old as a lineage. So about 430 million years ago, some sea creature called a Eurypterid came out onto land and became the first major terrestrial predator, or the first huge terrestrial predator. Um, so they came up, they were already predators in the sea, they were like this huge... Uh, actually, I have a, a video of a, of a reenactment of some uh, Silurian-era scorpions. Um, and, and they were already these huge predators, they were monsters, they were eating fish, they were eating other arthropods, uh, things with exoskeletons. And um, they already probably had a stinger, um, and they certainly had claws, and they basically resembled the scorpions of the modern era. In fact, the scorpions of the modern era even still retain the gills that their, that their marine ancestors had. Um, they have these gills. The gills are now internalized into structures called book lungs that passively respire air. So while the, the, the scorpions of, of yacht, of, of, of the ancestral form, uh, could be upwards of seven feet long, the scorpions of today are really constrained to their, to their uh, size, which is at maximum six inches from head to tail, um, because they passively respire oxygen. So they don't actually have lungs that breathe in and out. They just have these book lungs, which are modified gills that, that absorb air passively, uh, oxygen passively through the air. So they're these really kind of still prehistoric creatures. Today, there's about 2,400 species of scorpions that have been so far documented by science, but we're actually in this renaissance of scorpion understanding right now. Um, just a hundred years ago, there were only about 240 species that had been documented by science. And then this, this new technology came about, uh, and the technology has really completely changed how we're able to find and identify species of scorpions all over the world, increasing our understanding of them and our documentation. And that technology is often called a black light. So it's like the perfect kind of thing for nightlife, for a party. Um, you probably are more familiar with the purple hue that it gives off and lights your shoelaces up uh, as they glow under the black light. And scorpions actually fluoresce a bright green ultraviolet uh, color that you'll see in just a minute in a, in a little clip that I have. But here in this picture, we can see two, the two major groupings of scorpions. There's the, the group to the upper left, which are scorpions with big claws. Um, they're like really robust creatures with, that use, mostly use their claws for crushing prey and breaking it up into bits. Whereas on the bottom right, there's a, a scorpion which has a, a pretty thick tail. It's quite stout and, and conversely, its claws are really narrow. And that belongs to a group of scorpions called the boothid scorpions. Uh, and these guys are mostly using venom contained in their stinger at the end of their tail for subduing their prey. So here we have a, a sort of a, a, a fossil scorpion. This is a, a, a species of scorpion that, that, was that has been hypothesized to be one of, one of the first that ever came up onto land. And you can see it there to scale, um, standing next to a human. Uh, so it was kind of like a puppy. Uh, although there were other species that were, that were 10 times the size of this guy that were eating prey up to 150 pounds in size. Um, so they were, these were really substantial beasts. Uh, and just to give you a sense of, of how terrifying it would have been to live in that era, I uh, have this little video clip for you. Uh, here you can see this sea scorpion. Um, it's called Bronto Scorpio, uh, and it's chasing this fish through the ocean floor. This was still a marine ancestor. Um, these, at this point, they started to become amphibious, and it's hypothesized that they were becoming amphibious in order to take advantage of fish that were beginning to spawn upriver. Um, so these, these scorpions were, were able to um, uh, move from saltwater into freshwater uh, and compensate for the change in freshwater uh, to take advantage of that prey resource. But here you can see that this Bronto Scorpio is just being dominated by yet another species of Eurypterid or sea scorpion, um, which is much, much bigger in size uh, and, and uh, quite substantial, really sort of the king of the sea and about the size of a modern day grizzly. Uh, in fact, they were the largest arthropods of all time, these, these sea scorpions. Um, so in the modern day, the scorpions have moved out of the ocean. They're entirely terrestrial now. We don't have any species of marine scorpion other than uh, one that lives on a beach in Mexico. 
Um, there's a species that, that's that's intertidal, but it's certainly not living underwater for for most of the most of its life. But you can see that scorpions really occupy virtually every habitat on Earth. We have scorpions in the Andes, we have scorpions in the Alps, we have scorpions in the desert, we have scorpions in tropical rainforests. Um, so oftentimes when scorpions are depicted in movies, it's almost always in a desert uh, setting. And they are, I think, are really oftentimes aligned with being in desert ecosystems, but they're really in almost every ecosystem on Earth outside of those that freeze for substantial parts of the year. Scorpions are also, modern day scorpions anyways, are, are nocturnal creatures. Uh, almost all scorpions are nocturnal creatures. There's a couple of exceptions. As always, there's exceptions to everything in nature. Um, but in general, they, they're coming out at night uh, and their activity is tied to the lunar cycle. So scorpions come out and they're most active on moonless nights. Uh, and it's hypothesized that that reason for that is, is twofold. First, it makes them harder to be seen. So they're predators with the things that are eating them, which I'll get to, um, are, are difficult to see. Uh, they're, the scorpions are difficult to see, so their predators aren't as good as seeing them. Um, and the other is that it's been hypothesized that on moonless nights, there's the clearest view of the sky of the celestial stars. Um, and the, the reason for that is a really important one. Um, scorpions are, you, are nocturnal animals, so they're eating prey. They're still predators. Um, they're eating things that come out at night, like moths and crickets and, and insects. And they have to leave their home. They've constructed these deep burrows in the sand. Um, oftentimes it's just in the dirt, or other times it's like underneath a log. And that's like their home territory, their home range where they stay. They keep stay hidden during the day. They keep away from predators. But when they need to come out and forage and to meet mates, um, they have to come out at night, and it's really important that they're able to get back to those burrows because those burrows are really energetically costly to construct. They're excavating dirt out of them. In some cases, they're like a meter deep with corkscrew designs and false exits and entrances to, to evade their predators. And so if they leave their burrow, they have to figure out how to get back. Um, so I... I don't know if, if everyone here is familiar with how a GPS functions, but basically the way that GPS functions, when you have your phone out and you're trying to follow your map to get to wherever you're going, like the restaurant you went out to dinner for back when people went out to restaurants for dinner, um, Google Maps, what it's doing is it's triangulating your location. And what that means is it's looking up to the, to the sky, in this case, cell towers, because it's a cell phone. Um, but if it was a traditional handheld GPS, it would be looking up to satellites and it would be trying to find at least three satellites and then calculating your position as in the center of those three satellites if you were to draw a line to the center. Um, so GPS is, is not 100% accurate and occasionally depending on if it hits off of a satellite or a cell tower that's really far away, it gets your location really wrong. But this same concept of triangulation is what scorpions have been hypothesized to use when they come out on moonless nights and leave their burrow uh, out in search of a mate or in search of prey. Um, they're, go they're looking up into the sky and they're triangulating their position and the position of their home um, as the, the, the center of three um, sort of key point stars that they're looking up into the sky and finding. Uh, and this is particularly important in places like sand dune systems that are completely featureless. There's no plants, there's no rocks, there's no sort of landscape markers that they can go out and, and remember their way home uh, by looking out for those landscape markers. Um, but, and while scorpions have really cool behaviors that have evolved over these 430 million years, um, what's, what, what's equally interesting is some of the other behaviors that they've brought along with them uh, over their long history on Earth. Um, so I'm going to show you this video. Uh, this is a video of a scorpion courtship. I think, remember, earlier I told you um, that scorpions fluoresce under, under ultraviolet light. So these are scorpions with an ultraviolet light, light shining on them. And you can see this, this kind of blue, sometimes it's hues of green fluorescence. And what you're observing these two scorpions doing is, is uh, what's called a pas de deux. Uh, so it's a courtship ritual, wherein the male runs up to the female, grasps her hands with his hands, and then begins to do sort of a ballroom dance across the environment, um, leading her back and forth slowly. And now what you're seeing is, the, is another uh, part of this courtship ritual, which is called chalicerol massage. And that's where he takes his mouth parts and he reaches out and begins to massage and stimulate her mouth parts with his own. Uh, and we kind of would say in our human interpretation of this or our humanizing of this behavior that it's kind of like kissing. That it's really like an exchange of of bodily fluids and and uh, pheromones and scents 
Um, and it really tells the female scorpion that the male is of the same species, that he's interested in mating, and that she should probably not eat him because oftentimes uh, that is the way that it could potentially end up, given that she's typically much larger than him in total body weight and size. Um, and so this courtship ritual will continue until he uh, lays down what's called a spermatophore, which is a gelatinous stalk that's tipped with a sperm packet. Uh, and that sperm packet is then picked up by the uh, genital opening of the female should she choose to do so. Although oftentimes, um, rather than picking up the sperm packet and storing it inside of her reproductive system, uh, she just eats it uh, as a nice little snack and goes off on her own separate way instead of eating the male. Um, other times, if the female decides that the male did a good dance, he's a good dancer, he's got some gr great moves, um, she'll go ahead and pick that sperm packet up and she'll store it inside of her body and she'll keep it there until she's decided that the conditions in the environment are right for her to become pregnant. Um, and then that's the next really cool thing about scorpions uh, and something that's probably been really to their advantage in evolutionary history is that scorpions are the only arachnids that give birth to live young. Um, and so here's a video for you. Uh, th of, that's taken looking up underneath a scorpion through a piece of glass at her genital opening. Her genital opening is like right in between those two sort of comb-shaped uh, structures. Those are called pectines. Those are sensory structures for smelling and feeling vibratory signals on the ground. Um, they're kind of their ear and nose and mouth, uh, like, sorry, taste buds all in one. And here you can see this baby scorpion embryo because she's incubated it inside of her body in her overuterine system. Um, she's, she's giving birth to this baby scorpion. And uh, a single scorpion, depending on the species, can give birth from anywhere from two uh, upwards to 150 scorpionlings. That's what they're called, scorpionlings. Um, and these little scorpionlings will come out uh, and they'll be enveloped in an amniotic sac, just like uh, most mammals, including humans are. And that amniotic sac will eventually burst and her care doesn't stop there in case you thought scorpions were really nasty little creatures. Um, not only do the moms give birth to live babies, but they also uh, care for those babies after birth. Um, the babies crawl up onto the mother's back and the mother carries them around regardless of whether they're two or 150 um, until they've gotten large enough to go off onto their, on their own. Usually this is after they've molted their exoskeleton at least once. Um, making them larger and, and, and more robust and ready to take on the outside world, looking like tiny little versions of, of scorpions. Um, so the next thing I want to tell you about is my favorite story from, from our new Venom exhibit. Uh, it's one that I was really hoping would make it into the exhibit because it's near and dear to my heart. Um, I'm, I'm really a scorpion expert, but in, in particular, I'm, I'm, I study a group of scorpions called the bark scorpions. And the bark scorpions are awesome little creatures, uh, particularly because they're not very big. They're just a couple of inches uh, long. And we, all, we have a couple of species in the U.S. None of them are of really any major particular concern um, in terms of their venom potency. But on the other side of the border in Mexico, uh, there's a, quite a few species, about half a dozen species, that are capable of delivering a lethal envenomation to humans, to adult humans. Um, luckily, there's a, a commercial anti-venom that's available that uh, people can take if they get to a hospital in time and it completely reverses the, the, the reaction to the, to the envenomation. Um, and it's been hypothesized. And in fact, a researcher uh, named Dr. Ashley Rao has been studying this system for a while now and has provided really good evidence that part of the, perhaps part of the reason that scorpion venom in the bark scorpions has gotten so, so incredibly potent is that these, these predators, like this very ferocious looking one here on screen, the southern grasshopper mouse, are driving increasing virulence in the venom. So it's essentially an evolutionary arms race where in the Arizona bark scorpion is, and bark scorpion, uh, these handful of bark scorpion species are developing more and more potent venom, increasingly potent venom. Um, and that's because they're trying to es escape this fearsome predator, the southern grasshopper mouse, which is 100% uh, a predator. They only eat meat and they rip the heads off of scorpions like with no, with impunity. They don't care. They can get stung in the face because their, their immune system um, allows them to combat this scorpion venom that kills adult humans uh, in their, inside of their little tiny body, enabling them to eat scorpions uh, as, they, as they desire, as their little hearts desire. Um, and so I actually went out to the, the, the scene of the crime, to the place where um, the southern bark scorpion and, uh, sorry, the southern grasshopper mouse and the Arizona bark scorpion meet. Uh, this is in Arizona. 
and I went out looking for um, these scorpions so that I could bring them back and put them into the exhibit along with some uh, grasshopper mice that we uh, we that were also collected in in southern Arizona uh, in the same area as these as these uh, bark scorpions. So um, here I am. I'm in Arizona. I went out, and in one single night, I collected like 150 uh, bark scorpions from somebody's greenhouse, which was like about I think it was a house of horrors because it was quite terrifying how many scorpions were in this greenhouse uh, in southern Arizona. Um, but I was able to find them all and bring them back, and they're like happily living their lives, uh, reproducing, having babies, and uh, being carefully cared for by our aquarium biologists. Uh, for the venom exhibit uh, and they're going to be exhibited alongside these scorpion mice for the very first time um, not together in the same cage because the scorpion mice would just eat all of them uh, but right next to each other uh, where predator and prey can almost look through the gla glass at one another um, but I wanted to show you this video of these scorpion mice just in case you're unconvinced about how terrifying they are um, so here's a little scorpion mouse you can see he approaches the scorpion the scorpion nails him right in the face. And these are extremely uh, powerful stings. In fact, it's a, a really uh, a toxic neuropeptide that attacks your nervous system and it basically convinces your cells that you, to tell your brain that your hand is on fire even though all, it's, all that's happened is a tiny little pinprick. Um, so it hijacks your nervous system and changes the way that your, that your cells communicate with one another. And I'm going to play this one more time just to show you what happens. So the mouse approaches the scorpion, gets nailed right in the face. You can see it hurts. This mouse is reacting. He starts scratching his face, he hops away, and after just a few seconds, something clicks, and he doesn't care anymore. He's still kind of squinting his eyes, but suddenly this mouse just returns and resumes the attack. And what's happening inside this mouse is that its immune system is recognizing the scorpion venom, and it's converting the scorpion venom from being a pain-causing agent to being an analgesic or a pain killer. So it changes the scorpion venom using its immunological response to being something that prevents it from feeling pain. So now it can go back and just attack the scorpion with impunity, just rip its head off and eat it, and the venom doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how many times it's been stung. Uh, so it's a really incredible uh, uh, outcome of this evolutionary arms race. And just to leave you, I wanted to leave you in case you're unconvinced first about how adorable scorpions and scorpion mice are. Um, with this video of these scorpion mice, uh, because I think it's, in case you didn't think they were a fearsome predator, not only do they eat scorpions, one of the most venomous creatures in the world, without any consequences, but they howl at the moon to defend their territory. So here's a little video I'm going to play for you of this scorpion mouse, mouse howling at the moon. Pretty adorable. And while I don't think that you can hear this howl, through the glass of our exhibit, uh, you might, if you're really lucky, be able to catch these scorpion mice howling inside of their terrariums. Thank you. Hello. All right. So, um, Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Emma Cosina, and I am a biologist at the California Academy of Sciences. And um, I've been working there for about three years. Uh, my primary areas are going to be the rainforest, but I also work with the African penguins and the albino alligator clawed. And most recently, I've been working in the venom exhibit. So that's what I'm going to be talking about tonight is um, what it's like to care for those animals and what goes into making an exhibit like that. Um, so our official name is Venom, Fangs, Stingers, and Spines. And just a quick recap on um, Venom versus Poison. Um, venom is gonna be something that actively has to be injected into you. So Fangs, Stingers, Spines. You're gonna get bit by something, it's gonna sting you, you might get spined by something. So that's how that venom is getting into your system. And then poison is actually gonna be something that you ingest. So if you um, you know, were to lick a toad or something, that's more of um, poison. So all of the animals that we have in venom are actually venomous, not poisonous. And we also have some animals that are non-venomous, but have very interesting relationships with venom. So I'll talk about that a little later. Um, so I'll go over what's 
involved in creating a new exhibit, um, some containment and safety of these dangerous animals, some tools and tricks that we use um, in feeding these animals, and then um, we'll do some questions with uh, Lauren and I after that. Okay, let's open new, a new exhibit. Where do we start? So um, at the California Academy of Sciences, if you've ever been here, you've seen we have some really large exhibits and we don't really change them structurally very often, um, but we do sometimes change the animals that we display. And so with this exhibit, what's really special is we have this area that we can do um, temporary uh, exhibits. So um, the last one that was there was animal attraction and this one, um, is venom. So we usually have those for about five years. And um, what we do is we work in many with many different departments in the academy. So we'll hear from a lot of those uh, people tonight, what goes into uh, this, into making these exhibits. So we start with um, what story do we want to tell? Um, and in this case, we wanted to tell the story of these animals that are using this uh, compound to uh, either help catch prey or to defend themselves. And what's interesting is when we isolate those compounds, we can actually use them for human medicine. So it's a really interesting relationship um, that we've been able to study is something that seems so scary um, and deadly is actually quite helpful in some um, aspects of medicine. Um, so once we decide the story that we're gonna tell, we look to make a list of those animals that is going to fit that theme. Um, so, you know, we'll go and make our dream list of pit vipers and crazy stuff like that. And then we look at the actual space and the safety of it. And um, this particular space is a little bit smaller. So we want to make sure that um, we're containing these animals. And if we need to take one out, it's not, you know, getting loose in a shared space. So um, we look at that as well when we're picking these animals. Luckily, there's many um, terrestrial invertebrates uh, or insects that have some really interesting venom. So um, that's just something that we're, we're looking at when we're looking to acquire our animals. And then where do we get our animals? Um, so some of these, these animals are, um, are displayed at other zoos and aquariums. So that's the first thing we do is we'll, we'll kind of look for other institutions, other um, AZA uh, zoos and aquariums to uh, acquire these animals. So an example of this, um, so that black bug that you see there, that is a white spotted assassin bug. And what we did is we took a half day um, at work and we went over to the San Francisco Zoo because they actually have um, them displayed in their insect zoo. And we trained with their staff on how to safely handle these bugs. And, um, and we took some back with us for our collection. So um, you'll see them in Venom. We also, since we do have a lot of um, invertebrates, we are um, under strict permit with USDA because not everyone can just have these um, animals. And we especially don't want them getting out into Golden Gate Park because a lot of them are not native to California. Um, so that's something that we make sure all of our permits are up to date and we do get inspected. Um, something else that's really great about working at the uh, academy is that we are also an active science uh, research institute. So as Lauren mentioned, um, our bark scorpions actually were collected by her. So that's really neat. We get to um, partner with research and, um, and display them for you guys to see. Um, so now we go on to containment. So we acquire our animals and we, we work to make habitats that not only look naturalistic and mimic their um, natural habitat, habitat, but also are going to keep them contained. And a great example of this is our Eastern bumblebee colony. Um, so this is a top-down uh, view of the colony and it's actually contained within an acrylic box. Um, and you can see right now they're, um, they're working on their little underground hive. So uh, this species makes um, their nests underground. So they're constantly digging and um, making new little um, nectar pots or uh, pots for their, um, their young. So this is the top-down version of that. And um, our number one concern with displaying all these animals not only venomous, all the animals at the academy is basically containment. How do we 
display these animals for our safety, but also for theirs. Um, some ways that we do that um, is double containment, which I'll talk more about. We use a lot of locks, lock everything up. Um, and we also have some uh, venomous animal servicing protocols, emergency protocols that we follow. If anything were to happen, we've run drills, we know what to do. So um, we're ready, we're ready for it. Um, and, and we go through extensive training. Uh, you have to be venomous trained to open any of the locks. So um, I will show you some of that. Um, so here is another view of our bumblebee uh, ex uh, container, as you say, the bumblebees in the box there. Um, so this is looking straight at it. Um, there is a door in the front that you would be able to open um, if you wanted to get inside of um, the box there. And what we do is that's actually held in our holding space right now. And we will um, bring it to the exhibit space, which is pictured to the right of it there. Um, so that's back of house uh, venom. And we'll take the box of bees in another container and walk it over to the exhibit to put it in. And it actually connects, it's pretty cool. Um, you'll have to come and see it in, in action, but it actually connects to uh, a pipe so that the bees can fly up and forage and come down and uh, return the nectar. Um, so as you see here, there's a net around the door. Um, we put a mosquito net around the door just in case when, if you were to open the, the exhibit door, and a bee was loose, it would just fly into the net and that's an easy way to catch it. So that's a great example of double containment, a container within a container. And we literally have our, our safety net up to, to catch anyone who were to, to get out. Um, and then here's some signage that you would see um, back of house. So very clear um, if you're, um, servicing an exhibit, you might use this sign that says, hey, warning, venomous animals, animal servicing, don't open this door. Um, but what we do here um, at the Academy is you're never alone when you're servicing a venomous animal. We have a strict protocol that it's at least two people. You also have someone on radio and you basically call out on the radio, hey, I'm opening this venomous exhibit. I'm going to feed it and then I'm going to call you when I'm done. So this is just communicating to the whole team, hey, um, we're dealing with this this venomous animal, don't come over here, um, and we safely did it, and we're done. So um, there's some pictures of some locks and some signage. Um, we do not have a rattlesnake in the venom exhibit, but it's got some great signage. It's part of our um, our collection in the, uh, the aquarium. So um, it says, warning venomous animal. You can see we've got some red locks here, a skull and crossbones, um, really just telling people not to open this. And um, the locks themselves have, there's only a handful of keys that exist anyway. So you have to be a uh, venomous trained to actually open those locks and have the key. Here's, here's a picture of myself in front of um, the Venom exhibit, um, showing you some personal protective equipment. So we've all become very um, familiar with PPE, with the face masks that um, are required. So I'm actually wearing my face mask, which is protecting my coworkers. Um, and then I've got my face shield on, my leather gloves, and I'm holding a pair of really long tweezers. They're about a foot long. And the reason I'm dressed like this is because I'm about to uh, service the white spotted assassin bug habitat. So um, this is an insect that um, not only can give you a nasty bite, um, but they um, can also spray their venom. So the reason I'm wearing the face shield is it causes temporary blindness in humans and I am protecting my eyes. Um, and you can see here, they have this really pointy mouth um, rostrum that they're gonna inject their venom into the soft body of the cricket and they actually dissolves their insides and they slurp it up and um, they just leave me the husks of the crickets that I have to clean up. So that's what I use my giant uh, tweezers for. I don't put my hands straight in there um, because I do not want to get bitten. So I'll use those long tweezers to um, access that habitat and take stuff out. So I'd probably say those are our favorite tools in Venom. It gives you a 
a good distance from the animal if you're if you're trying to feed it and um, you don't want it to bite you. Um, some tools and tricks that we use in venom, you'll see a lot of red lights. Um, and the reason for this is um, some of these animals are nocturnal and um, we want you to be able to see them, but it's also good for us to monitor their health, make sure they're eating, because if we come in and they're always sleeping during our daytime, we're not able to see if, um, if they're acting normal and healthy. So we display them with red light. Um, they're on a reverse light cycle. So um, for 12 hours during our workday, they're on the red light. And then we, when we go home, they'll be on white light, we'll, which will simulate simulate their daytime. Um, so that first picture is of the bark scorpions. There's about 80 in there and you probably will only see maybe three or four um, because they are very cryptic and they like to hide um, even under the red light. And then in the middle here is Tim. Um, he's working with our uh, bumblebee colony. And what we do when we actually open that exhibit is we'll turn off all the lights and we'll use red light. Um, so that's what the photo is beside that. That is the bumblebee colony that you saw earlier, except under red light. And that that sort of confuses them. They think it's nighttime. And so they won't want to fly around because they can't see as well. Um, so that, it'll actually subdue them. So we can reach in there with our long tweezers and um, grab anything that we need to. So um, red light's really easy to um, display these, these nocturnal animals so that we can see them, you can see them. Um, it's a great tool. Oh, look who it is. Um, another uh, animal that you'll see under this red light is um, the adorable grasshopper mouse. Um, pretty hardcore um, eating this scorpion here. And um, as Lauren uh, mentioned, and you saw the videos, um, this mouse does have the ability to um, eat scorpions because it can convert that um, venom into a painkiller. We do not feed our mouse scorpions. So scorpion fans, don't worry. Um, we actually feed uh, crickets and mealworms and she gets these little uh, pellets as well. So um, she's housed right next to the bark scorpions, but she's not able to gnaw their heads off. So don't worry. Um, and so she's also on that reverse light cycle. So you'll see red during the day. She's actually in that um, hamster wheel in the back, if you can kind of see her back there, it's kind of hard. Um, and then when we go home, she'll go on her daylight. Um, Um, and lastly, I wanted to show um, one of the more interesting animals that maybe you wouldn't think about um, when you come to see venom. Um, it's our leeches. Um, so they, uh, their saliva actually contains compounds that are anticoagulants um, and anesthetics. So when they latch on to you or an animal, you might not feel it. And that's their saliva that's an anesthetic, so that's why people don't usually find leeches on them until later. Um, and what's interesting about them is they don't need to eat uh, very often. They um, can go about a year without feeding. And one of the things, I mean, we really wanted to have leeches in the exhibit, but we also know what leeches eat, and I'm sure all of you do too. Um, and that was one of the 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 challenge is we're like, okay, how are we going to feed these leeches, uh, you know, every six months? And um, our biologist, Logan, um, actually um, goes to the butcher every four months and gets cow's blood and puts it in a, um, in like a natural sausage casing, warms it up and feeds leeches. So I have this uh, cell phone video of the leeches um, feeding on this blood sausage. So if you're not into that kind of stuff, I suggest you look away for the next couple of minutes, but if you're fascinated by it, it is pretty interesting. So I'll play it for you. And so they usually sort of hang out just like towards the bottom of the exhibit, don't really like swim around that much, um, except when there's food and they get a little excited and start swimming around. 
Um, so since it's heated up, they're attracted to that warmth and um, you'll kind of see them start latching on. So the one up at the top is now going to start to feed and they kind of just pump themselves full of blood. Um, and we'll let them do that for a couple of hours. And then they, they pretty much double in size. And then um, throughout those four months, they'll just get a little bit smaller and smaller until it's time for them um, to feed again. So something that you don't see every day, we definitely don't do it every day. It's a, it's a unique feeding um, here at the Academy. So I thought that was pretty interesting to share with all of you. Um, and then with that, um, I just want to thank everybody who worked on this exhibit, um, the Venom team, um, for all your hard work that you put into this. And um, we hope that, oh, here, let me, I have another cute slide with some pictures. There we go. Um, <laughs> so we hope that everybody stays safe and um, this exhibit's ready for you. Uh, we were supposed to open in March, so we are ready um, for when we reopen. Um, so hopefully when that happens, um, you'll be able to come see it. And this was just a sneak peek into it. There's lots of great animals um, that are awaiting uh, your discovery. So thank you so much uh, for listening. Thanks, Emma. Um, I think we're gonna pull up Lauren as well. And then we have a few questions from our viewers. Hey, Lauren. Um, our first one is for Lauren. What got you interested in scorpions? Uh, Lauren, I think you're on mute still. Uh, I was saying that like, it's, I think it's like the kind of question that anybody that studies any kind of animal gets all the time. And I wish I had some amazing story of like this epiphany moment where I was walking through a tropical rainforest and saw a scorpion, but that never happened. Uh, the reality is, is I, I, I've always been super into like smaller things. Like I was really into flipping over all the paving stones in my garden as a kid and like looking in tide pools. I'd spend hours looking in tide pools. Um, and then when I went to college, I took entomology. I took a class in entomology and was like, oh my god, I love entomology. Actually, I had like insect collections and stuff as a kid. Uh, but I also really loved ecology and evolution as fields of study. Uh, and then I did this internship where I was introduced to scorpions and, and thought like, ah, like, if you're interested in questions about ecology and evolution, what better place to turn than something that's been around since any other terrestrial predator, any other predator on land? Um, and so I kind of started down this path of scorpions and was really fascinated by like their behaviors and like the ways that they've been able to carve out a really successful niche for themselves uh, for a very, very long time. And, and I've never really turned back since. It's still a good story, even if it's not some <laughs> magical moment. Um, for Emma, uh, do you slowly change their day night cycle to get them to the inverted cycle or can you do it quickly? Um, yeah, so when we acquired the grasshopper mouse, um, we, we pretty much did it right away, um, and she didn't seem to have any problems with it, and, um, also with the scorpions, they were mostly hiding under, um, the, the wood that we had in there, so it was easier to do it with them as well, um, so they didn't seem to mind, um, we always do look at those things, but, um, it was a pretty easy transition for them, so, um display. Great. Uh, back to Lauren. Uh, why did the scorpions become so small and why did the large ancient scorpions die out? That's a really good question. Um, so the modern day, modern day scorpions are really constrained by the amount of oxygen that's in the air and the way that they breathe. So um, in, in previous periods on earth the oxygen content was in the atmosphere was much higher. And so the, the rate of oxygen absorption into your body could be much higher as well. So um, back in, in, in the Silurian and in the Cretaceous, uh, even in the Jurassic, things were large. There was huge dragonflies, huge insects, huge spiders, huge scorpions. Um, 
when they were in the ocean, there was also higher oxygen contents in the ocean, higher oxygen content in the marine water. Um, and so they were able to be really big as well. It's, there's less constraint as well on, on marine organisms. Um, some, some of the other constraints on, on scorpions and other uh, arthropods on land is gravity. Um, they have an exoskeleton, and that exoskeleton can be really heavy uh, and make musculature. the musculature in an exoskeleton versus an internal skeleton is not quite as efficient. Um, so there's a maximum capacity that you that those muscles can hold that that exoskeleton can sustain and still um, maintain its structure. So oxygen content has gone down. Um, gravity is a problem, and so things on land, uh, arthropods, so things with exoskeletons on land, have gotten smaller and smaller over time since becoming terrestrial. And the other thing that happened with these with these eurypterids, eurypterids were like had this had this moment on Earth where they were super diverse. And eurypterids are the sea scorpions, the ancestors of modern scorpions, where there was like many many species. They were eating each other. They were eating fish. They were eating other things that were living in the ocean at the time. They were eating everything really. They were the first like massive predators. And um, then about that same period of time, this thing happened called fish. And the fish started getting bigger and bigger, and the fish became more and more dominant in the oceans. When fish started out, they were these small little creatures. Um, they were being dominated. They were pr primarily prey. They were primarily eating um, vegetation material, not eating other um, other animals. Um, and as the lineage of fish, of modern fish, evolved, particularly bony fishes and armored fishes, uh, that they were slowly outcompeting the niche space that these sea scorpions were occupying in the oceans. Um, and so scorpions did a switch. They moved from oceans where they now suddenly had all this competition onto land where they were competition free um, and then started dominating the land. And they've, I mean, arguably they still dominate the, the arthropod food webs on land because they're kind of top predators among other invertebrates. Um, so they've, they've still succeeded in their, in their, in their global denomination of global domination. That's the right word. Global <laughs> domination of arthropods. <laughs> Nice. Um, I think we have time for one more question um, for Emma. What, which animal is the exhibit in the exhibit venom would have the most serious effect on humans? Um, so of the ones that I work with, um, I work with primarily the terrestrial species. So I can't say for sure about the aquatic ones, um, but for the terrestrial animals that I work with, it's actually one of the smaller uh, animals that we have, um, and it's going to be our black widow. So just the way that that um, that venom works uh, with humans, some people can have really extreme reactions to it. Um, so that's one of those animals that has the heavy duty lock on it. We do, um, you know, two or more people and it's got the the. Um, the radio backup because some people can have really strong reactions to that. Um, I don't think people die often from that bite, but that's one of our more dangerous uh, animals actually, and one of our smaller ones. And those scorpions too. <laughs> of course. Um, thanks, Emma and Lauren. Uh, we're gonna move to kind of the design side of the exhibit. And next up we have Ashley. Thank you. Hi everyone. How cool is this place where I get to work? Uh, my name is Ashley Boiter and as uh, was said before, I am a 3D designer at the in the exhibits department at Cal Academy. I know that exhibit design is not one of the most well-known museum job functions. So tonight I'll start um, with a quick summary of what my job entails in a general way and then I'll share in more detail just one of the exhibit elements I designed for the Venom exhibition. Um, many of the images I will share tonight are not actually from the Venom show, and that's not um, to confuse you, but some of the themes are just better illustrated. Um, oh wait, am I now? Do I go now? I'm sorry, am I live now? <laughs> okay, got it. <laughs> um, Many of the images I will show are not uh, actually from the Venom exhibit. That's not uh, to confuse you. It's just that some of the themes are better illustrated with other exhibitions. Um, also, I will use the words, um, I will use 
the words exhibit and exhibition somewhat interchangeably, but for the most part, exhibition refers to the overall experience with and exhibits are certain areas or elements within the overall exhibition. Um, I hope that makes sense. Um, so first, why do we distinguish between 2D and 3D design? Um, at the Academy, we have both and both are responsible for finding ways to tell stories in visual and physical ways. 2D exhibit designers, um, also known as graphic designers, uh, specialize in graphics for environments, specifically exhibition environments, rather than for something like a computer screen or a magazine, for example. And as I move through um, this not so well composed slide deck, it will become clear that 2D design is not my strong suit. Um, 3D designers like myself design the three-dimensional aspects of the exhibition environment. Uh, I focus on things like space planning, um, the rhythm and flow through the exhibition space, certain aspects of ADA compliance like wheelchair accessibility and the caning needs of visually impaired and blind visitors. I also design three-dimensional elements like physical interactives, for example. Think of an exhibit where you need to pull a lever or crank a wheel to experience it. I design those. I also work on furniture or cabinet-like needs for the exhibits. Uh, for example, think about a digital interactive on like a touchscreen monitor. Um, we have digital designers who design the, um, the, the, the actual digital interactive on the screen that you engage with, but the monitor itself needs a piece of furniture um, that will hold it up at the right height and at the right angle for optimal ergonomic usability, um, and it has to hide all the wires for safety and aesthetic reasons. I designed that part. Um, of course, I do get to work closely with the 2D designers on many aspects of the exhibition. We partner on general design needs, like the overall look and feel of the exhibition. Um, for that, we mull over things like color palettes and lighting options and textures until we agree that we've like nailed an atmosphere that best represents the exhibition tone and themes. We also work together to make sure there is, for example, enough wall space to balance all of the environmental graphics, like the text and images needed in each of the exhibition areas, while also keeping in mind that visitors need elbow room and opportunities to rest their eyes and feet throughout the ex exhibit space. More often than not, less is more when it comes to museum audiences. As visitors, we are absorbing so much information throughout our museum experience and museum fatigue is a real thing. Over 30 years of museum visitor research data tells us that visitors will stay longer, learn more, and leave feeling more enthusiastic about their experience if they are not overwhelmed with too much information all at once um, at any part of the museum. So sometimes we decide to make a wall longer or shorter. Sometimes we decide to make the text longer or shorter, or change the size of an image, depending on what will make for a more um, appropriate impact or experience while also considering the neighboring experiences. We look for balance and a rhythm that features more and less intense experiences that support each other throughout the space. Um, decisions like these also involve other important team members, especially our ex exhibition content developers who, with a team of advisors, write all of the text in an exhibition. And they are the main keepers of the exhibition narrative in a big picture way and also in the details. So as you can see, making museum exhibitions is a huge team effort that requires a lot of very specialized skill, cooperation, collaboration, and extremely skilled project managers to keep us all on track. I'm just one person on a team of 10 to 20 people, depending on the scale and scope of the exhibition. Okay, so as far as scale and scope for Venom, um, Venom is actually one of our smaller exhibitions but it's definitely sort of like a bang for your buck kind of experience. It's only about 500 square feet as compared to our largest exhibition spaces, which are more, um, they're around 9,000 square feet. Here in this image, um, it's highlighted where the Venom exhibition is in the aquarium space and the overall aquarium space. And the aquarium itself is around 27,000 square feet. Nevertheless, I think that once you all have a chance to see it, you will also find Venom to be a small but mighty exhibition, kind of like that scorpion mouse. 
Um, because the exhibition is so small in scale, it gave us an opportunity to expand the scope a bit and um, spend some time experimenting with projections and other lighting techniques new to our team and process. We learned so much and uh, we hope that you are as pleased with the results as we are. And I'm not gonna talk about that um, too much. Um, you'll get to learn more about that if you stay tuned for my colleague, James, who is coming up next. Also, of course, Venom is filled with some of the most fascinating and beautiful creepy crawlies around, as Lauren and Emma shared with you earlier. Um, however, not every story we wanted to tell in, the Venom, in Venom could be told using living collections. For a couple of stories, we needed to turn to our non-living collections, um, those specimens we keep safely stored away for research and sometimes when we're lucky also for exhibit purposes. At the Academy, we have a wealth of over 46 million objects in our collections. They range from the very large, like this taxidermy bear named Monarch, who was the model for the California state flag, and even larger, much larger, like this blue whale skeleton that I'm sure you've seen if you've ever visited the Academy, um, all the way to the tiniest virus and bacteria specimens in our microbiology collection. And while our aquarium biologists like Emma are experts in habitats for living collections, part of my expertise is creating microenvironments for non-living collection items. This happens to be the part of my job that I get sort of the most geeked out about. I love working on the aesthetics of an exhibition and I have a special affinity for lighting techniques, but probably the main reason I wanted to be an exhibit designer was so I could, I would get to work with all of the special things in museum collections and help figure out the best ways to share them with as many people as possible. What these microenvironments sometimes look like to you as a visitor is a simple plexi plexiglass box or window with an object or group of objects inside. We call these cases or casework and the plexiglass barriers are not the only features that protects that are not the only feature that protects the objects inside. In a few minutes, I'll share with you some parts of the cases you don't see, but which are vital to maintaining the appropriate microenvironments required to protect the objects while they are on display. So one of the animal stories we wanted to tell um, in the Venom exhibition is about platypuses. You may not know, you may or may not know, I didn't know before I started working on this project that male platypuses have a venomous spur on their hind limbs. Um, they're one of very few mammals that produce venom <clears throat> and they use their spurs when competing with other males during breeding season. I think that's pretty fascinating. Um, well, the venom exhibition is located in the aquarium, but this part of the aquarium is not equipped for a habitat that could safely sustain a living platypus. So after more deliberation than I can uh, go into at this moment, the team decided we would display a taxidermy platypus. And that's where I come in. One more important factor in protecting objects, especially uh, one, sorry, one important factor in protecting objects, especially those made up of organic materials like the flesh and fur of a taxidermy platypus is to light it only with very low lighting. That's because light damages certain materials. Uh, think of a piece of paper or fabric that's been bleached out by the sun. For reference, classrooms are usually lit at around 40 foot candles and libraries at around 20 foot candles. Generally, we want to shine only about five foot candles on objects like the platypus to keep them from bleaching out and undergoing other types of material degradation caused by light exposure. As you can imagine, when the objects are in storage, it's pretty easy to just keep the lights off most of the time. But when they go on display, lighting is very important. We want visitors to see them after all, that's the whole point. So when I'm working on an exhibition with objects that need very, very low lighting, the whole exhibition is affected. Part of the trick is to keep the ambient lighting in the space fairly dark so that visitors' eyes have um, adjusted to the low lighting by the time they see the object. And then the five foot candle level is plenty bright enough for them to see the objects clearly. This isn't too difficult to accomplish in the aquarium because the ambient light down there is pretty low to begin with, but other galleries can be very difficult to get the lighting low enough, uh, but that's, that's, for another, that's for another talk. Um, also, however, when lowering the lighting overall, I have to be very careful that I'm not making it too dark and therefore unsafe to walk around in. 
So I try to design the lighting scheme so that it transitions in stages from brighter to darker and then brighter again as needed throughout the exhibition space. Another lighting challenge with the platypus was that the initial display requirements stated that the display lighting could not be within the case environment. A requirement like this is usually based on a fear that it is too difficult to get the light dimmed down low enough when the light source is so close to the object. And also it will create, possibly create extra heat inside the case. I'll come back to why heat is uh, bad in a minute, but these are not unfounded fears. Back before there was LED and fiber optic technology, exhibit lighting options were limited and they did generate heat. You would have wanted to keep those lights as far away from objects as possible. Now there are many LED options to choose from that give off little to no heat. Fiber optics are also great, but they tend to be on the expensive side and we just didn't have the budget for that on this project. Um, LEDs are more affordable, but the challenge with LEDs is that there is so little electrical current flowing through them. It is difficult to get them dimmed down all the way to, to five foot candles without them starting to flicker or just shut off entirely. This is also a problem and has limited the usability of LEDs for specimen lighting. Still, I was determined to figure out a way to light the platypus from within the case because lighting it from outside the case created a number of visibility problems with shadows and glare. So to make a very, very long story short, with the help of a very knowledgeable and enthusiastic uh, in-house electrician, whose name is Mark, we researched and tested the newest products available and found an LED and dimmer combo that would dim low enough without flickering and that we could afford for this project. Uh, then Mark custom fabricated a lighting fixture that would work inside my case design. And with the help of our other team members, we prototyped the case interior, including the internal lighting element. And then we closed it up with a temperature and humidity recording device inside. We collected data over several different 24 hour periods and in different parts of the museum. Lucky for all of us, the prototyping and data collecting proved that our custom internal lighting would not generate extra heat inside the case and that we could dim the lights down to five foot candles without flickering. Huge success. All right, in addition to delicate lighting, another key to preserving taxidermied objects, whether they are in storage or on display, which in many ways is also a form of storage, is to keep them at a stable relative humidity of about 45 to 55%, so not too wet and not too dry, and at a stable temperature range, um, usually around 65 degrees, give or take. Um, stability is important because fluctuations in temperature and humidity cause the object materials to expand and contract. And the more they do that, the more they will break down and tear apart. And we don't want that. Um, but remember where we are, we're in the aquarium. When you walk around the public floor of the, the Steinhardt Aquarium, looking into the beautiful aquarium windows inside the walls, it may not seem that warm or humid to you. However, behind the scenes where the aquarium biologists access the tanks, those leeches and the mice and the scorpions, um, it is very warm and very humid, which makes sense considering the habitat needs of aquatic and semi-aquatic animals. So here we have another case design challenge. This platypus case was to be installed where an aquarium tank had once been, meaning there would be a viewing window on one side of the wall for visitors, but the whole body of the case would be behind the wall in that warm, humid environment. So I needed to design a maintainable, cool, dry micro environment in the middle of a warm, wet macro environment. Also, because this case would live against a wall where it is warmer on one side, back of house, and cooler on the other side, the public floor side, there's a potential for condensation to build up inside the case as cool meets warm. This would be very bad. So another special design feature of this case is a passive cooling attic. You can see this case hat was designed with a slanted roof and two vents pointing out the front. Um, the bottom vent takes in cooler air from the pub public floor side of the museum, which mixes with the warmer air inside the case and then releases the hottest air out of the top vent. The angle of the roof helps with the direction of the airflow up and out of the top vent of the case. This maintains an acceptable internal case temperature and creates a balance between the two spaces so that condensation does not form. The attic also houses the lighting element we created and has a translucent barrier separating the attic from the specimen chamber. 
This helps trap heat above the specimen chamber and also helps us maintain that five foot candle limit with the, with the lighting elements still pretty close to the object. Um, these were design features we also tested when we were prototyping lighting. So there are many other aspects of this one case design I could share, uh, like it's marine grade watertight shell and it's hidden desiccant chamber, which is the way we keep the humidity low. But I think I'll stop after showing you just one more little thing. In the end, we did end up making use of the external lighting track for this display. Again, Mark, with his endless innovative thinking, fashioned a teeny tiny spotlight for the platypus's little venomous spur, and it makes me really happy. So I'm happy to share it with you. That's it, thanks for listening. I hope you all come to see the Venom exhibit as soon as you can. Hi everybody, uh, I'm James Davidson. I am a visual designer here at the California Academy of Sciences. Um, and today uh, I'm excited to show you some behind the scenes work uh, on the making of Venom. Um, first off, I uh, want you guys to all kind of take a look at the, the word uh, Venom itself and the way it's written out. You'll see uh, some of these like sharp angles to it. Um, a lot of uh, the, a lot of design uh, actually went into the development of the word mark itself. Um, uh, we had uh, an initial iterations were developed by the Creative Studio, um, a, a group of designers, uh, allowing us for a wide variety of unique ideas. Um, uh, some of them we had done by hand, some of them were digital, these were early iterations. Um, and then as a team, we discussed which ideas were best to move forward uh, in keeping the intention of the exhibit, um, showcasing the duality of venom as a powerful weapon or defense mechanism, but also as a potent medicine. Um, we wanted uh, the word mark to be uh, visually striking. Um, so uh, ha had uh, that in mind as well. Um, ultimately, uh, we came to this solution. Um, the final word mark, uh, it inspired, it's inspired by stingers and barbs of venomous animals with its sharp angles. Um, but we also wanted it to be have a friendly quality, so the upper and lower case uh, letters kind of uh, bring that more inviting, friendly quality. Um, and ultimately, this uh, theme of uh, these sharp angles um, was uh, expressed throughout the rest of the exhibit. Um, this is a quick uh, visual of the exhibit itself. Uh, I wanted to give you a peek inside of the exhibit. Uh, as you can see, there are uh, these sharp barbs uh, uh, kind of all throughout the uh, visuals that are placed uh, within the walls of the exhibit. Um, and, uh, but uh, that being said, there was a lot of iteration that went into uh, the development of this exhibit, um, very collaborative um, in order to get the final result. Uh, early within the exhibit, uh, it was helpful to seek out inspiring imagery imagery uh, to develop uh, a mood board. Um, in addition to the Creative Studio team, uh, we work with the exhibits team, uh, scientists, content developers uh, at the Academy, uh, other Academy stakeholders uh, to craft an informational direction for the exhibit. Um, and using uh, that information, we try and suss out keywords that would be helpful uh, to inform the visual direction. So as you can see here, uh, we went uh, with Venom, uh, it's sharp, there's toxins, uh, uh, colorful, warning. Um, even even uh, discussions of like hazy or like how it differs from poison. Um, ultimately looking at it visually, uh, we uh, landed on this uh, style and direction that includes sharp angles, dynamic visuals and vibrant colors. Um, and with this in mind, we were able to uh, move forward and uh, start iterating on the exhibit uh, itself. So these are some initial iterations. Uh, you can kind of see how some of those uh, uh, notions come through with the sharp angles, uh, dynamic colors, uh, and vibrancy. Um, uh, I worked closely uh, with another uh, designer, uh, exhibit graphic designer, Alana Ko, uh, in developing uh, some of these iterations. 
Um, uh, again, very collaborative process, uh, which I really appreciate that. Uh, it's really nice to be able to work with other creatives uh, to be able to uh, bounce ideas back and forth as you move forward uh, with these concepts. Um, uh, as you can see here, uh, most of these visuals show uh, animals. We wanted to showcase uh, these venomous animals uh, early on. We wanted to make sure that they're part of the highlight of uh, the exhibit. Um, and we thought one of the more important aspects uh, would be to also highlight um, how these animals are venomous. So you can see the snake with its fangs. Um, Similar to what was done with the word mark, uh, we ended up coming up with this sharp angles approach. Uh, this color scheme uh, with the uh, green that we ultimately went with, it helped to brighten the area, which really offsets it from the rest of the aquarium at the academy, um, which uh, oftentimes is a little darker, uh, uh, often blue tones. Um, and so this really sets it off um, in a different uh, light. You, you're gonna get yourself a different experience when you come to this uh, area of the aquarium within the academy. Um, here you can see the venomous areas of these animals are being highlighted. Uh, the, the vampire bat's venomous bite um, with, these, with these triangles and the cone snail's venomous harpoon-like structure, um, also uh, very venomous. Uh, and even in the... Uh, text graphics, there's sharp angles, because again, we're trying to uh, move this motif forward throughout the entirety of the exhibit. In addition to the interior of the space, we needed to create a very attractive entryway to entice our guests to enter uh, and experience the exhibit. Um, there's two entryways to this about 500 square foot exhibit uh, near the back of the aquarium. Um, this work uh, had to be very highly collaborative with the uh, creative team as well as the exhibits team um, uh, as this is a physical dimensional built structure. Um, the intention here is to attract guests into the exhibit experience um, and be attractive enough uh, to entice people to come in uh, without having them stop in their tracks. Um, uh, here you could see these are iterations uh, from uh, my colleague Alana Ko. Uh, she had done some early sketches uh, uh, where, and we had discussed some uh, aspects of it that we really enjoy. We, we thought the asymmetry was uh, uh, quite powerful. Um, the dimensional aspect was something that we were hoping that we could incorporate. And, and again, we thought it was very important um, to highlight the animals. So we thought that would be uh, a, a good option moving forward. Uh, we opted to utilize a very similar motif uh, to the interior. Um, it allowed us uh, to kind of create that consistency from the interior as well as the entryway kind of driving you forward into the exhibit experience. Ultimately, this is where we landed. Um, uh, this is the one of the main entryways into the exhibit uh, itself. You can see kind of through uh, the exhibit how the entryway uh, really works well with the motif that happens inside. Um, but in addition, uh, you can see this is just a photo here, but in addition to the visual style, we wanted to add a bit more of an intrigue. So we opted to uh, use, as Ashley had mentioned, um, a, a new technique of projection mapping um, to and lighting to create an animated approach uh, to the entryways, kind of uh, draw people in through these subtle motions of the of these seemingly still pieces um, that somehow seem to be moving. Um, so we started with early iterations uh, of just getting the idea um, uh, across to the team that how are we going to successfully create. Uh, this animation um, on that would project onto this printed piece. It was uh, quite a technical feat, um, uh, and again, very highly collaborative, uh, working with the 3D uh, designers uh, for the built space itself, working with electrical engineering, lighting, uh, and the Academy's visualization studio, who has developed uh, some of our uh, planetarium shows everybody was involved in getting uh, this to become a reality. 
the dimensional direction um, was a very interesting uh, decision, especially considering the projection mapping. We had to be very considerate of how uh, dimensional we were going to make these pieces uh, because we were working with a single projector for each uh, entryway and we didn't want the lighting to create too much shadow off of these dimension uh, dimensional elements. Um, additionally, we had to be very considerate about what areas were printed versus what areas we would project onto. Because uh, again, uh, we wanted to avoid um, areas where there would be overlays uh, of a printed piece uh, with an animation if, if it was for example, as you can see here, uh, the area of the body of the scorpion is uh, static and printed, but the tail and the claws um, were intended to be moving back and forth. So we didn't want to get that printed um, as that would be uh, later projected onto. If it were printed, you would see this odd overlay. Um, ultimately, uh, Without the projected image, um, the archway itself um, might look a little looked very different. Um, it almost I would almost even say that it might look a little incomplete. Um, but uh, fortunately, uh, we had uh, a plan for that, and we were working with this projection mapping. We it allowed us to um, utilize this uh, motion um, and the lighting uh, and add color, new new color and dimensionality. Um, and the, uh, the animation itself, for example, the scorpion um, was done again by the visualization studio uh, digital animator Ken Ackerman did a great job, work, worked very closely with him uh, to create the animations all throughout uh, both, of the, both of the archways. Um, and he uh, uh, did a really good job of taking the illustration um, and adjusting it to be something that we could uh, create uh, motion with, uh, integrating seamlessly the printed and animated pieces. One of the last aspects of the uh, development of the entryways was color correcting. Um, and the colors appear very differently when printed or viewed on screen or projected. And we needed to do this uh, projection and color correcting on site and in person in order to respond to the actual projected colors. Um, you could look at uh, all these videos on your screen, but you're, not, you're just not gonna get the same sort of colors um, as you would with a projected light. Um, we went through so many different iterations here. Uh, here you can see a lot of different uh, colors mapped out just so those would be projected and we could see what they look like when projected. Um, and, and we were able to designate, oh, which color uh, is best and which colors pair well with what other colors. Um, it can be very subjective, so it was very helpful to have the team there uh, together to kind of finalize the color selection um, and in addition even to deciding uh, and finalizing on the colors themselves, uh, we had to uh, deliberate on how vibrant um, the uh, projection should be. We didn't want it to be so bright uh, that it really almost like blinded you as you were coming in. We wanted it to kind of seamlessly integrate with the printed visuals. Um, and. Uh, it was very helpful to have those printed visuals to use as color corrective pieces, um, allowing us to match this printed yellow with this projected yellow. Um, quickly, uh, here's just a snapshot. This uh, a little dark, again, uh, this is uh, the projected uh, map, uh, mapped out entryway uh, the other side. Um, but this is the, basically a team photo of a, a, a number of the group who would come to these lighting um, color corrective tests um, as well as check in the animation sequences to see how they're working. Uh, it was a, a, a wonderful team, uh, really appreciative of everyone's input and uh, everyone's effort. Um, it was uh, 
the the this again is an early photo uh it was very helpful when we finally got the printed pieces uh in the interior and then the lighting uh was set up correctly uh because once that happened we were able to very much more easily utilize those as a reference towards the colors we were trying to get you can see here some of like these yellows are leaning a bit green um, and ultimately uh, they needed to get a bit more warm. Um, lastly, this is the final uh, visual of the entryway. Um, you can see the animation works well with the illustrations. Um, uh, it's almost hard to tell what's been printed versus what's been animated other than knowing uh, what's moving around. Uh, it's a, it, again, trying to keep it a subtle uh, motions uh, that would really intrigue people. Um, almost, uh, you'd almost be able to uh, miss, the, uh, miss the animation itself uh, if you were just walking by and uh, again, uh, walk right in, uh, very inviting. Uh, lastly, I'd just like to give a quick thank you to everyone on the team uh, who worked on this. Um, uh, especially those on the uh, archways and entryways. Uh, I really uh, could not have done it without uh, the wonderful Venom team. Uh, here's just a small uh, core group for the archways, but there were so many other people uh, who are played very important roles in the uh, Venom exhibit itself. Hey, James, thank you so much. Um, we're gonna bring Ashley back on to do a few Q and A's. Hey, Ashley. <laughs> um, okay, so yeah, a lot of people really loved um, hearing about exhibit design because it's something I think like the Academy doesn't really talk about that often to a public audience. So um, a couple of the questions I think are, are, are some that um, a lot of people have, which is how did you become an exhibit designer and also like a visual designer for museum exhibits? Like what's that path look like? Uh, should I take this? Yeah. Yeah, it looks like your sound is a little wonky, Ashley. My yeah. Do you, you want to take it? talk for a second? Sound? Sure. Yeah. Uh, I'll, uh, I'll start. Um, yeah, a visual designer at the Academy of Sciences. Uh, it's a great opportunity. Uh, I'm really happy to be there. Um, I started actually in advertising. I've always just, but I've been always interested in science, um, especially uh, space. Um, that's always just been something fascinating to me. Uh, I'm, I've always been interested in learning and using what I've learned uh, and expressing that to other people um, in ways that make it simple for them to learn. Uh, so uh, working at a museum is a great uh, place for me to be, to be able to take what I've learned and share that with others uh, in a hopefully easy to digest, uh, very engaging way. Ashley, how's your sound? Uh, you tell me. Is it better? Good. No? Okay. Yes. Is it good? Is it okay? Is it delayed? Oh, yes. Yes. Yeah. No, you're okay. Delayed, but you're a little. <laughs> okay. Um, I'll try to <laughs> be short. Um, I have a background in anthropology. I studied archaeology and um, I really like things. I think I mentioned that in my talk. I love artifacts and objects and specimens and collections and uh, I took some aptitude tests and they told me that, you know, I should be a designer. So even though I had done, you know, four years as a archeology span major, um, I had some affinity for design. So I, you know, my 22 year old self um, decided to take a little bit of a, a veer away from the humanities. And I got a master's degree in interior architecture with a concentration in museum studies and exhibit design. And that's how I got here, specifically because I wanted to design museum exhibits. I very much like did the thing that I went to school for, which is great. I feel very lucky for that. Yeah. Um, this is a really interesting question um, that Ashley, I think you'll, you might be able to talk to. Somebody asked, how much do you have to change an exhibit design now that we have to take COVID-19 into account? 
Um, some more than others. So the exhibits that are more highly touchable and interactive, um, some of those exhibits we have to take offline entirely. Um, for example, um, for those of you who are familiar with our annual Tis the Season for Science exhibition that we do every year, um, that exhibition has historically been uh, very interactive, very family fin friendly, very t very playful and festive um, in its um, concept. And the entirety of the exhibition that is usually in the piazza, like we can't do that anymore. Yeah. So we are working on a concept that just focuses on the reindeer um, so that the uh, whole of Tis the Season for Science can be outside this year. Hopefully, if we're open uh, for visitors to come, we'll have the reindeer and then some supplemental exhibits. Um, but we have a task force that is going throughout the exhibition to the permanent exhibits and um, examining and um, making decisions about what exhibits need to be modified and what exhibits need to be taken offline entirely. Um, yeah, so we're it's very front of mind. Um. So here's a comment uh, and a question for you, James. Uh, the visual graphics have a lot of animal motion and detail. How do you collaborate with a scientist on accuracy? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, so what we do with the animals, uh, first we determine which animals we uh, wanted to illustrate and we had a number of them and some more than we ended up using um, so that we uh, had options. Um, and from there we, would work with scientists to either get images of these animals or we would track them down and research some images for ourselves uh, as reference visuals. Um, and then from that, do iterations on illustrations, uh, sharing uh, early uh, sketches to make sure that, uh, for example, for the, the snake, that the pattern was uh, the right pattern or that its head shape was correct. Um, uh, you, they, you can really hone in on the details um, and it's uh, surprising how s some of the smaller details are really what's going to make or break whether or not the animals are uh, depicted scientifically accurate, um, which is uh, absolutely something that we uh, strive to make sure that we are doing. Awesome. Um, this is a question for, I think, both of you, but somebody asked, uh, how do you make exhibits accessible? Um, so accessibility is a part of every aspect of the exhibition. So I think I touched a little bit on sort of my main um, responsibility when it comes to ADA code. So um, the baseline is sort of like wheelchair accessibility, caning. Um, we want to make sure that everyone is able to get through the space. Um, but when it comes to like interactives, for example, um, when I say you need to like use your hand to like crank a wheel or um, or pull a lever. We design those in ways that um, make them more accessible for people who have hand disabilities. Um, we also think a lot about soundscape. We know that there are lots of um, visitors who come to the museum who have um, sensory, um, sensory disabilities. And so we wanna make sure that nothing is too loud or too abrupt um, and um, then I think James can talk more about the accessibility when it comes to legibility and contrast and type size. Yeah, yeah ab ab absolutely, yeah. So uh, one of the things that I uh, always think about uh, when I think of accessibility in terms of visual design is a uh, uh, high enough contrast. You wanna make sure that, um, I think oftentimes about like colorblind, you wanna make sure that uh, the, the colors are contrasted well enough that you can see what you're trying to see and as well as type sizes are large enough so um, that they're easily legible. Um, one of the things that uh, is really exciting that we started to introduce in uh, our exhibits uh, for accessibility is uh, multiple languages, um, which uh, it, it does add uh, another step towards uh, the development process, um, but it's a very uh, helpful step that allows so much, so many more people to interact with uh, the exhibit itself. We also, anytime we have, um, anytime we have video content, we make sure that there are captions. Um, there are 
um, we do as much as we can to make sure that all aspects of the exhibit are as accessible to as many people as possible. Um, and if there are some parts of the exhibit that we feel like we can't make as accessible, we try to um, mitigate that with having other aspects of the exhibition that are more accessible to different types of abilities. Great, thank you for talking about that. Mm -hmm. um, I think I have one more question also for both of you, um, but do you have a favorite piece of this specific exhibit and how does it compare to a different favorite from a different exhibit? I have, well, I mean, obviously I'm a huge fan of the Spur Spotlight. Um, <laughs> we knew that but, was great. <laughs> yeah, but one of the habitats in the exhibit, I was in the other day finishing up some final lighting stuff and the um, the habitat for the fishing spider mm -hmm. is this awesome, like tiny swamp habitat that is just so cool. And maybe I'm biased because I'm from Louisiana and like, you know, <laughs> swamps have a place in my heart, but this little habitat for the, the spiders is just beautiful. It has, it has these stratospheres. There's like spider webs at the top and then the water comes up and the water has a layer of beautiful green um, foliage on it. So it separates mm. the water from the air. It's just, it's, it's just, it's really well done. It has these beautiful cypress knees in it. I'm a huge fan. <laughs> um, yeah, kind of along the lines, one of my favorite aspects of the exhibit, I actually really enjoy the animals in there. Uh, the velvet ant is actually a very interesting uh, creature to look at. Um, and it's, it seems pretty rambunctious moving around most every time I've uh, seen it. Um, in terms of the design, I was I was really excited to try the new uh, projection mapping and working with such a large and varied team uh, to be able to uh, make that really come to fruition. Uh, it was a really fun and exciting idea early on, and then to see it develop uh, and then uh, come to be finalized, and it just turned out I'm really really happy with it, and I think everyone did a good job. Yeah, I'm really, really looking forward to seeing it in person one of these days. So, um, well, thank you so much, both of both of you, for joining us. It's so Thanks great for to having hear. us. This yeah, yeah. Thank you much. okay, night, Lynn. Hi. Thanks everyone for tuning in and a special thanks to Lauren, Emma, Ashley, and James. Hope you will all come by to check out Venom once we reopen. Uh, next week, we're, we're taking a break, so we won't be here, but we'll be back on September 10th with Night School Coast to Coast. Uh, we'll be exploring the fascinating ecosystems that exist where water meets land. And again, thank you so much for tuning in and your support during this time. And I saw a lot of comments um, from you saying that you can't wait to check out the exhibit, which is, which is great. We can't wait to have you back. <laughs> Um, but if you're able to, while our doors are still closed during this time, um, please consider a donation to the Academy's Relief Fund. Um, any amount helps, really, and the donation link is in our YouTube description. So thanks again, and have a good night, everybody. Stay safe. Thanks.